Hi. Hello, everyone, and welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage. I'm Samantha Shokin, Manager of Public Programs, and today we are joined by Holocaust survivor Faye Malkin, her daughter Debbie Schoenberger Pierce, and filmmaker Judy Maltz for a discussion of Judy's 2009 documentary film, Number Four, Street of Our Lady, which tells the remarkable story of Franciska Halamayowa, a Polish Catholic woman who rescued 16 of her Jewish neighbors during the Holocaust, including Faye, while passing herself off as a Nazi sympathizer. Frances Faye Malkin was born in the spring of 1938 in Sokol, Poland, which is present-day Ukraine. In 1941, shortly after the Germans invaded the Sokol region, the Gestapo shot and killed 400 of Sokol's Jewish men, including Faye's father. Fearing for their lives, Faye's remaining family fled to the home of Halamayova, who subsequently hid them in the hayloft above her pigsty for two years. Worried that Faye's inconsolable crying would reveal their hideout, the adults tried to silence her with poison. Miraculously, she survived. In 1949, Faye moved with her family to the US, where she went on to become a successful real estate broker. In 2007, she returned to SoCal with her cousin, filmmaker Judy Maltz, to film number four, Street of Our Lady. By the end of the war, only 30 of SoCal's 6,000 Jews had survived, half of them rescued by Halamayova. The film draws on excerpts from a diary kept by Faye's uncle, Moshe Maltz, and incorporates testimonies from Fran, other rescued Jews, and Halamayova's two granddaughters as they reconnect on a journey back to SoCal. So um, I wanted to welcome Faye, and also uh, we're, we're joined by Faye's daughter, Debbie Schumberger pierce and Judy Maltz, a uh, filmmaker who is presently a senior writer for Haaretz, Israel's leading newspaper, where she covers a wide range of topics with a special focus on the Jewish world. Judy is the producer and co-director of two award-winning documentaries, one being Number Four, Street of Our Lady, and the other, uh, the other film titled From the Black You Make Color. She was the recipient of the 2014 B'nai B'rith uh, World Center Award for Israeli Journalism for her coverage of the Jewish diaspora. And today she is joining us from, I, th I think it's Tel Aviv, right, Judy? Tel Aviv, yeah. Fabulous. Welcome, Judy. Thank you. Uh, and finally, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Faye, Faye's daughter, Debbie Schoenberger Pierce, who also appears in the film. Uh, Debbie has worked as a professional art consultant since 1995. She studied art at the University of Vermont and graduated with an undergraduate degree from Syracuse in advertising and a master's from NYU in art education. Normally based in New York, Debbie is currently joining us from Vermont. So welcome, Debbie. Hi. It's great to have you. It's great to have you all. Um, it's, it's wonderful to, to hear and see you all, however much I would love to be in the same room. Um, it's, it's great that we have this technology uh, that we can all connect from different uh, points of the world. So I, it was incredible watching the film. I, it was my first time um, learning of this story, really. Um, and I guess for my first question, I, I would like to ask Judy. Um, Judy, what was your experience growing up with this dark family history? And when did you decide to make it into a film? Well, I knew the story of my family's survival, and maybe uh, I should I should say right now, Moshe Maltz, who was Faye's uncle, was my grandfather, my late grandfather. Um, he and my grandmother and my father were also saved by Francesca Halamayova. So as far back as I can remember, the story it was not something uh, that was hidden. My grandparents talked about it a lot. And as a child growing up, I, I was actually quite fascinated by it. And uh, I spent a lot of time with them and I asked a lot of questions. Um, so it was always something uh, I knew. Uh, at some point in my life, I don't re really remember how old I was, um, I kind of lost interest in it. You know, I became a teenager, I went to college, got married. Meanwhile, my grandfather, who uh, he died in 1992, I, I never really got a chance to ask him questions when I was already an adult. And uh, I, I, I regret that very much because there are certain things that, that I will never know about this story. Um, 
And uh, there's, there's nobody around anymore who can provide us with the answers to many, many questions. But at some point in my life, I guess it was um, maybe mid, uh, midlife crisis, I started uh, thinking about it again. This was about, I guess, uh, 15 years after my grandparents had already died. And uh, I've always been interested in documentary filmmaking uh, ne had never made a film uh, before, but um, I was about to start taking class in documentary, documentary filmmaking at a college where I was teaching at the time. And um, the instructor asked me if I had an idea for a story that I would like to make uh, a documentary film about. And I said, oh, she said it had to be a three minute long film. I said, I have an idea, but I think it will require more than three minutes to take this, tell this story. Uh, a week later, I approached this professor and I said, uh, don't think I'm crazy, but what do you think about coming with me this next summer to Sokol? It's a town in Ukraine and making a documentary film together. And that's how that's how we made uh, this film. <laughs> wow. Wow, that is amazing. Um, I, I will be showing some clips from the film for, for those of you who were unable to, to see it in time. Um, I, I forgot to mention that we will also have time for a Q&A um, uh, at the end of this program. Um, and I encourage all of our viewers watching to submit their questions and comments into the chat. And, and I will do my best to incorporate them into my interview. Uh, and, and also, um, uh, in case you were unable to watch the film uh, before this program, it is available online on Vimeo and, and I believe um, Netflix, if I'm not mistaken. No, Amazon. Amazon, sorry about that. It's on Amazon and also Vimeo. And I will send out a link uh, to all of today's registrants uh, to the film and also to the recording of today's program. Um, so no worries if uh, your friends were unable to, to make it today. Everything is being recorded. All right, so uh, my next question is for Faye. Um, Faye, can you tell us how Judy approached you um, with, with this proposal to go back to Sokol? Were you reluctant to go back and did it take any convincing on the part of Judy? Uh, no, when Judy approached me, you see, unlike Judy's side of the family. I didn't speak to anybody about it, including my uncles, my mother. Debbie knew about it, but there wasn't much discussion. But I always had it in my head, I'd like to go back to Soko to see it. And now there were three of us that were children who were still available. Uh, around the, all the adults were gone at that point. And my uncles always said, if you go back to Ukraine, they'll kill you. So when Judy approached me, I was, yeah, I'm on, I'm on board. Her father needed a little convincing, my cousin. But there were three of us still left. And yeah, I was really looking forward to this. That's amazing. And, and Debbie, uh, were you also on board with with this or what did it come as a surprise to you what was your reaction um you know my mother always asked if i wanted to go with her back and i and i was always i'm always up for the adventure so um and i wanted to see what it was like so no i i was full fully um on board with it the thing is i had just had a baby and um she was was she four months old when I left? So that was um, the one thing that um, <laughs> the timing was a little off. So I ended up meeting them in the Ukraine. And um, instead, they all went from Israel and I went by myself to the Ukraine. And um, what, uh, why I had no fear, my mother was very deathly afraid that I was arriving in the Ukraine by myself, that nothing should happen to me. Mm. That's, yeah, that's the family story if you read the diary. By the way, that's the diary. 
Can you hold it up a little bit higher? Yeah. yeah. Years of Horror by Moshe Mollis. Yeah. Well, my, I, grand um, my grandfather, um, I neglected to say this, my grandfather kept a diary in war uh, in Yiddish. And um, without that diary, we would not have been able to make that film. Um, because my grandfather left in the, the diary very, very important information, such as, most importantly, the address of the home where they were hidden, and hence uh, the title of the film, Number Four Street of Our Lady. Um, obviously, that is not the name of the street anymore, but we did have a researcher uh, based in Ukraine who was able to find out for us where was uh, Street of Our Lady and where was number four, and that's how we found the house. Um, and of course, he, there were many other addresses and names in the diary, which by the way, I had read years before, but then I started reading it again while making the film and reading it over and over. I pretty much know it by heart right now. And um, there is incredible historical information in that diary. Um, and it was, it, it was a, a treasure to have something like that in making a film like this because the, uh, one of the great challenges was that our main characters were not alive anymore and could not provide testimony. Uh, when, and when I say our main, of course, thankfully we had Faye and my father and um, Ellie Kindler, another survivor, and Sam Cram, who you meet at the end of the film. But my grandfather, my grandmother, uh, the older generation, those who really remember were not around. And of course, Francesca Halamayova and her daughter, Helena. So we had to um, recreate the story with what we knew. And that was, you know, in, in this way, the, the diary was instrumental to making the film. And her two grand, Francesca's two granddaughters accompanied us. They live in Hartford now. Right, and, and they appear in the film. Um, yeah. I, so actually, regarding the, the address and uh, Moshe's diary, mm -hmm. um, Judy, you say that you, you know it by heart at this point. Were you able to read it in the original Yiddish or was it translated first? Uh, it was translated first, and um, I, I read it in the English, but there were certain points when things didn't make sense to me, or I couldn't really understand something in the diary when I would go back to the original Yiddish, and then sometimes with the help of my dad or my mother-in-law who speaks Yiddish, um, just try to figure out what exactly was being said, or if maybe there was you know, a missing sentence that could make something clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so when did the diary come into your life and how long, I guess, did it take you to do the research to put the pieces together in order to, uh, you know, start, start, the, start the filmmaking process? Well, the diary um, was translated into English just before my grandfather died in 1992. So we had had it around for quite a few years. Um, you know, I was talking before about some of the questions that I never had a chance to ask. Now, we always knew that my grandfather had a diary. It was like, you know, he used to, in the last years of his life, he would sit around and that's what he did all day was read his diary constantly. And, but I never, I don't think any of us, Faye, you told me, I, I never asked him why did he keep a diary? You know, I mean, there's a reason a person keeps a diary. Do they think that they will not survive and they want their story remembered, their piece of history, or do they want to leave it to somebody? Or was it just a way of, occupying himself during months upon months of spending time in a, in, a, in a pigsty with nothing to do. So I don't really know, and I don't think we'll ever know why he kept that diary. Um, but we, 
we decided early on, and, and, and this was um, a, a fabulous idea that my filmmaking partner had, that this diary would serve as kind of a through line throughout the film. Um, and the, 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 a, 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 if, you, if you've seen the film, if chunks of the diary, obviously not the whole diary, are narrated. But then we also wanted to juxtapose what my grandfather remembered or, or what he was saying happened then with other eyewitnesses and other people such as Faye and my dad and Ellie Kindler who had been there. And it's interesting getting all those different points of views and building the story around that. Absolutely. Um, Judy, by the way, speaking of Ellie Kindler, uh, someone just wrote that he is on this Zoom webinar watching, as well as several other members of the Kindler family. So, so hello yeah. to you all. Um, yeah. So if you don't mind, I would like to show a clip from the movie that was particularly um, striking to me. The scene where uh, you, you, you see, see where Helena Yova lived, um, you see her house for, for the first time in very many years. So uh, just a moment while I um, share my screen here. Uh, just a second, sorry. I wish, I wish this was more seamless. Um, okay, so can you see uh, the screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, oh, I forgot to change the settings for audio. Sorry, sorry. Just a moment. Okay. All right. So in this clip, we, we see that the house. Oh, God. I could never imagine being here. I know. We never imagined <laughs> They were afraid of the dogs, the German shepherds, because the Germans had them. Oh my God, just a cat. But this is just, yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Halamayova is bustling about her pigsty and her house, looking as busy and excited as the mother of a bride after all her wedding guests have arrived. She is looking for large pots and kettles in which to cook for 13 people. We should be happy. We, we should, should be happy. happy. <laughs> we should be happy to have sitting in her house. Then she runs out to shop for groceries. בדרך כלל זה היה מרק או כל מיני סוגים של בשר חזיר או משהו כזה. האוכל שקיבלנו, היינו מקבלים את זה בתור סיר או בתור איזשהו איזה סיר גדול, היינו צריכים לחלק את האוכל. And also with sauerkraut, I still remember the taste of it. It was so delicious. We are remembering and trying to visualize what went on, uh, how Helena or Franciszka could um, um, cook and, and, and help the uh, other people to survive. It's scary. Like, uh, what about the, uh, I don't know uh, which way that is. We all could be buried here. Sure. We all could be buried here in this place. But it uh, affected all uh, our life afterwards. Oh, yeah. We, 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 we want to deny it, but we can't deny it. No. no. It, it somehow or other, you know, yes. It's I mean, those who were older, my brother and my 
family and your family. Yeah. Which were older, so they had they had those scars the rest of their lives. Scars, yes. And they liked and, and, very And you and I probably also have some scars. Yes, but we were younger. Younger and we were able to cover them up a little more. We didn't understand everything that's yeah. going on. The horrible uh, So that scene was particularly striking to me. I love, Judy, the way that you were able to seamlessly weave together the various interviews, the, the diary narrative, um, and the conversation, and just the, the details, uh, like the way that Francisco would, would serve meals with pork. It's, it's really in, incredible. Um, so, we have a bunch of questions coming in here, uh, and, and I'll do my best to get to as many as we can um, in the time we have remaining. But I, I have a question actually for, for Faye. Um, so Faye, I know I, I, doing my research for this program that some years ago, uh, you had joined a writing program for Holocaust survivors at Duke University. And, um, and, and I know that that was a, a, a very um, life-changing experience for you. So can you tell us about that experience and how it helped you come to terms with your past? Um, that was, I, as I said, I never spoke about it to, to anybody, my uncles, my family. And I saw an ad that Drew University was gonna have a writing class for Holocaust survivors. It was around 1992, 93. And I just decided to join it. And I wrote my story. I just want to show you what I'm looking for. Um, I have, oh, it's down here. That's the wow. book they put out. And notice they, can you see they have Francesca, they put her picture on the cover. Uh, there were about 24 people who were in the group and we all wrote five, six pages on our story. And after that, it stopped at that. I told my story and that was it until Judy called and I guess it was 2006, 2007 when Judy said, do you want to do this? And I was, yeah. And after doing the film and after going back, and a lot of things changed in my life at that time around 2000. 10, 2012, uh, my husband died, um, my job situation, I lost a lot of people in that period. And that's when I became involved and then it brought it together. It also brought it together for me when I went back and um, I left Soko when I was six years old. And I was in hiding between, I guess, four and six. So I was born into it. My father was murdered when I was two years old, when they came into our town. So I really had not had a concept of a father. My mother never remarried. And it was... So when I went back and I saw the site, the old brick factory, where my father and 400 other Jewish men were murdered, um, that brought the whole thing to me for the first time. Because before that, it was just something in the background. And then it became very real. Right. Um, and I'm curious... Uh, for 
for, for Debbie, actually, um, when did you first learn of your mother's story and, and what was your reaction? Um, so it's something when I was a kid, we never really discussed, but somehow I knew the story, not the full story, but, you know, I knew she was a survivor. Maybe from my grandmother, she would, she would always tell me Hitler killed her husband. But as a child, I didn't know what that meant. I, you know, I thought personally Hitler killed him, that they knew each other personally. I didn't know exactly what, what she was referring to. And then when I was about 10 years old, um, Judy's sister actually had shown me a written excerpt in a book um, about Sokol Poland that we had that told my mother's story about, um, I'm, I'm assuming everyone saw the movie here about when she was poisoned. And I guess at 10 years old, you're sensitive and smart enough to know not to bring subjects up unless, you know, that could be so hurtful and harmful. So I never asked about it and I just knew the story. And, um, and she never discussed it until we, um, I would say when I remember her first discussing it is I guess around the time when she took the Drew University course, it was also um, Schindler's List had come out and Steven Spielberg was doing the Shoah interviews. And my mother did do a Shoah interview and I think that was probably around the time when I was able to learn more and ask questions. Before that, I did interview my grandmother once when I was a teenager for some school projects. So I asked her a little bit as a child might. Um, I do regret never really speaking to her about her experiences before the war or after the war. I never I never really knew my grandmother because she was just, it was just uh, more, I, we never talked about it. So, um, so I would say, you know, it was sort of a gradual learning process. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, about the, the, the poisoning. Um, and when I first learned about Faye's, uh, you know, childhood, I, I couldn't believe this. Um, and watching the film really helps, you know, bring it to life. So if you guys don't mind, I'd, I'd like to show a clip from the movie um, where, where this is uh, kind of depicted. So let me once again share my screen. The slightest sound from us could betray our presence to Mrs. Halamayova's neighbors. A sneeze, a cough, or even a gentle snore from one person could give us all away. Asur haya lano laim kol. Veiladim ze mot kashe laim kol pam. O shenachnu tzuchakim, o shenachnu portzi bebechi, o shenachnu medabrim tzuakim, mashu shelo matzchen menenu. My little four-year-old niece, Leah's daughter, Faye, won't stop crying. We all beg her to keep quiet. We give her toys, Hela's holiday gifts, but nothing helps. We are all terrified. Halamayova and Hela are still beating the piglets, but how much longer can they keep this up? We come to a terrible decision. My uncle Schmelke, used to have these speeches with me. And he said, we don't want to leave you. You have to come with us, but you're not going to cry, right? And I promised I wasn't going to cry. And when I got there, I cried. The decision was made uh, to save 15 people. You got to sacrifice one. And Dr. Kindler had poison on him. I. I really don't know what my feelings were. I don't know if it was fear. I don't know if it was horror. I remember them pleading with me not to cry. I remember them putting me down on the uh, straw, lying down, putting um, 
a pill in my mouth, crying and begging them to take this out and pushing the pill out. Uh, I remember calling for my aunt Yitte, please, I'll be good, leave me be. Finally, some of the poison seems to stay in. After a few minutes, Faye stops crying. Her eyes fall shut. She appears unconscious. She does not seem to be breathing. We all squat around the little figure lying on the straw as if we were already sitting Shiva after the funeral. Halamayova comes to us holding out a large burlap bag. The child's soul is with God now, she says. Put her in this bag. I'll bury her. Dr. Kindler leans forward to keep up the limp little body from the straw. As he touches the child, his sensitive hands feel something unexpected. He motions to me and whispers in my ear, there is a pulse. It's faint, but I can feel it. And they all thought that she was dead, but somehow or other she spit it out. When the doctor went over to me, he said my mouth was all bruised. And I whispered, Mama, ich lebe. Mama, I'm alive. You know, I've lived with it my whole life. I'm going to stop it there. Um, but what a, what a harrowing and gut-wrenching scene. Um, uh, can you, sorry, did I unshare my screen? Um, let's, I would like to uh, ask Judy a few questions about um, the making of the film and, and all of these difficult scenes uh, to capture. Um, so th throughout the, the film, we, in addition to the interviews with the various family members, uh, with, with Faye and others, um, there are also some local Ukrainians who knew um, Halamayova personally. Uh, I'm curious, Judy, how you were able to uh, get in touch with these individuals and track them down um, and, and uh, and also Halamayova's uh, granddaughters. Um, this, this is such a feat, you know, being able to track down all of these far-flung people. So what was your process for that like? So we've been in touch with uh, the Halamayova's granddaughters um, throughout the years. Uh, there's a, an excerpt uh, at the end of the film where you see um, they remember receiving all these packages from America growing up in Poland. And I recall uh, watching my grandparents send them packages. So there was always um, contact between the families. And when the granddaughters moved to America, we, we did have contact with them. In fact, they did come to a ceremony at Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust uh, Memorial Institute in Jerusalem when uh, their grandmother and mother were honored there as uh, what is described as righteous among the nations. Uh, it is a designation given to um, non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. So I ha we did have contact with them. I had not been in touch with them for years when I called them uh, one bright day in June 2006 and said, ha ha asked them if they would like to travel back with us to the town of Sokol, which by the way, none, neither of them had been to ever because they grew up in another town in Poland. But for me, as a journalist, uh, for me, the biggest coup of this film, which is kind of like the news that didn't exist before because we had my grandparents' diary. I knew the story, but the, the real uh, journalistic coup in a way was being able to locate people who lived there then because there were only three left. Mm. Uh, most of the population had been transferred out uh, when the Russians moved in, or even beforehand, the Poles, like Mrs. Halamayova, had been thrown out because there was the Ukrainian majority, and the Ukrainians hated the Poles as much as they hated the Jews. Um, so there weren't really original uh, uh, residents of Sokol around. There were three. And through uh, our researcher in Ukraine, Alex Denisenko, we were able to track down two of the three. Actually, all well, three, one did not want to participate. And hmm. I can only imagine what were the reasons. Um, so there was Maria 
and, um, and they were both extremely charming and welcoming. And um, for me, at least, they added something very special and new to this story. Thank you. Um, we have a, a few questions here about, well, this question comes from Susan. She wants to know how you were able to choose the film's narrator and whether he has a relation uh, relation to the film at all, um, because he has a peculiar accent. Uh, she wonders if this was done on purpose. Um, the narrator is my late father-in-law. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And um, we were, he might, he, he's Argentinian born, but uh, lived most of his life in Israel and speaks many, many languages, including Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for some, we didn't want an American. Uh, it was hard to find someone who had an authentic Yiddish accent, but we figured that he had an accent. It was so hard to really describe where it was from, and that would be good. And he also has this wonderful, wonderful voice and um, did a wonderful job. Yes, that he did, and, and that explains the peculiar accent. Mm -hmm. um, so question for, for Debbie and Fran. Uh, this film came out in 2009, so two years after the both of you went back to Sokol. What was it like watching it for the first time, and how have your lives been impacted by the film since? All right, I'll start, <laughs> Debbie. Uh, it, to me, it brought the whole, my whole life, for better or worse, um, into my life now because for 60, 65 years, didn't discuss it, didn't exist. And suddenly I was there and suddenly I was where my father had been murdered. And suddenly I was in my mother's old home where she had lived. And I guess I was there when I was two years old. And it was all around me and I had then I left at six, so I didn't remember it. And it's, it became very real. It was unreal before that. And I think I have paid a price for that. I had a friend who told me, don't go back. And I knew I had to. And it, it became... I don't know how to say a part of me where it hadn't been. And my father, the loss of him, what it meant, the loss of everything in my life. And my mother, who never really, really recovered well from that. So it became very much, and that's when I started speaking to schools and other people about it. Um, so... It's, it's now part of it, Debbie. Um, I think going back and then newly becoming a new mom and um, it became more, uh, first of all, I became obsessed about reading everybody's stories. I, f I felt like there's just millions and millions of stories. So I, I went on this binge of reading about the Holocaust and, you know, just till I, I'm kind of overdosed on it now. But I think having children at around that time just made me realize um, like the insanity. And I guess that's why I went on this binge reading on how people could could be so cruel to each other and, and all the children that never even got to grow up, grow up. And as my mother said, it became more real to me because it was something we didn't really discuss um, beforehand. And what I said before is I was, I'm always on the look for an adventure, but this was a more personal adventure. So. Thank you. Um, I'd like to show another clip from the film um, that really touched me. It's the one uh, where we're both Faye and, and Debbie um, up here, uh, let me once again share my screen. And second. 
Um, sorry, do you see the Vimeo page? I have to ask again. I do. You, you do? Okay, great. One of the things my mother's always talked about was um, the normalcy of life before the war. And life was just normal and it went on every day and for no reason at all it was taken away from them. And for no reason at all it created generations of people that have uncontrollable fear and, um, and life not knowing what a normal childhood and a normal life would have been like. I was very lucky I had a normal childhood and um and a happy childhood for the most part <laughs> and uh, i can't even begin to imagine what my mother went through um i think it's hard for all of us to imagine what what they went through um so we have time now for for q a i know some people have been sending in their questions but i i encourage uh everyone to, to submit your comments and questions in the, in the time we have remaining. Um, and also, uh, I'm getting a bunch of questions about uh, how to access this program um, later on. Uh, all museum public programs are recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So this one will uh, also be uploaded hopefully uh, tomorrow, if not uh, next week for sure. So, okay, um, we have a question here about actually several questions coming in about um, Moshe's diary. Uh, and, and the book was published at, at one point, um, but I believe now it is out of print. So can you tell us um, if people want to uh, read the diary, how can they access it? Is it available in libraries or anywhere else? It is available um, in um, many libraries, um, especially libraries that belong to Jewish institutions. Um, we probably do have to do a, a second printing one of these days, but um, yeah, it's, it, you can find it if you look for it. I mean, if you go obviously to Yad Vashem or the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington or pretty much any Holocaust museum that has a library, you, you will be able to find a, co a copy there as well as in, in universities. Um, I just want to say, if you can't find it, because I had dropped off some copies in your museum, but they were sold. Um, I downloaded it, and I think I sent it to you. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah. It's out of print. And um, so, yeah. anybody who wants it, let me know. <laughs> Let us know. We, we do have a, a PDF uh, file version of the book. Um, so, so if anyone's interested, we can, we can direct you to, the, to a variety of resources where you can I read. I just want to say about the book, um, it's not just our story. It's, he tells you from the time the Germans came into our town, the ghettos that were set up, the search for finding somebody to hide his family, it, and then the actual war two years we were in hiding, and afterwards to be uh, being rescued, you know, liberated by the Russians and the things he found. So I've been told by uh, people, um, if you know um, Natalia Alexion, she uses it in order. She says it's the best description she has read of her, of the uh, period of the Holocaust. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but but I, I want to second what, what Judy says. There should absolutely be a second run of printing uh, because it's just <laughs> such a important story. Um, so uh, more questions coming in here. This one comes from Susan. Uh, Susan asks if there is any information on what happened to Fran Francisca's husband or daughters. Um, I know that um, her son um, was killed. That was mentioned in the film, but, but the rest of the family, uh, what happened to them? 
the husband, um, the husband, as far as we know, um, they were divorced, uh, and he, we heard that he ended up in Canada even. Um, her daughter, she had a daughter and a son. The son uh, was killed by the Nazis under quite tragic circumstances. He was also helping to save Jews. Um, and her daughter had four children, two boys and, a two, gir uh, and two girls. The, the two girls and one son live in the United States. The older son died very young. He was married in Poland. And um, two years ago, I took a trip to Poland. Uh, it was part um, uh, for my newspaper, writing a story about the Jewish community in Poland. But I also joined a, a group of women on a, a group of women from Israel. It was an all women's trip to Poland. And I decided that when I was there, there was something, I still needed a little bit more closure after making the film. And I wanted to visit the town in Poland where Francesca had spent her last years living with her daughter. Um, so I took a trip to Rakshava. If you've seen the film, it's mentioned there. That's where she crossed the Bug River at the end and ended up in Rakshava in southeastern Poland. And I, and I got there and I met uh, Francesca's granddaughter-in-law, a daughter who had been married to the son who died. And the amazing thing was that she had an album with photographs that as a filmmaker, I was tearing my hair out that I didn't have it when I made the film. Mm. Because as I said before, one of our challenges was making a film where the people are not alive and we only had few photos and the photos repeat themselves. What else could we do? And we had photographs there of her as a young woman wow. in her 20s, uh, older in her 30s, but still with, with you know, her real colored hair, um, gorgeous photos. And I just said, wow, why did I not just make this trip while making the film? And it could have enriched the film so much more with these other photos of her from her younger years. So yeah, that was the widow of Helena Sun. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see those photos of, I'm sure many others watching here would as well. Um, maybe in the future, we can, we can figure something out. Uh, but uh, actually, here's a, another question about Francisca. Um, uh, sorry, can, uh, it comes from Robin. He would like to know uh, about Francisca's life after the war. Do you know if she was viewed as a hero in her community and not just among the survivors? Nobody knew. They right. never told anybody. She, in fact, wrote my grandfather um, a letter. And um, I have um, a, cut, a letter that he wrote. I don't know who it was written to, but he said that she made him swear while she was on her deathbed that he would never tell anybody what she did. So nobody knew. Even her, her granddaughters did not know the whole story. They, you know, as they say, I think in the first sentence in the film, they heard that their mom and grandmother saved their friends. They didn't even say they were Jewish. It was not something you would talk about in those times. Yeah. Um, so in the film, there's a conversation um, happening uh, about, uh, how would you put this? I, I, Francesca's altruism uh, and, um, her, her personal decision to, to save the lives of these 16 uh, Jews um, and, and risk everything doing it. Uh, so uh, Carrie would like to know what factor do, do you attribute to um, Francesca's altruism and, and why, why do you think she, she decided to, to risk everything to do this? What made her kind of um, different from her neighbors in this, in this regard? Anyone can answer open-ended you I can't mm. I can't answer I think she, 
she was a very tough lady. I was intimidated by her, so I stayed away because I had cried and caused all that problem. Um, I think if she had a drive, if you were trying to kill Jews, I won't do it. I'll, I'll protect them. It was, she was, she was defiant. Uh, but otherwise, there is no way of telling it because had any of us been captured, she and her daughter would have been killed too. So it's, and one thing, we were never hungry. Uh, we had, she fed us, um, she took away our waste. She was a total caretaker. We called her the angel, the mala. Yeah, I think, I forget who it was in the film, maybe Chaim, who said that uh, she's just a sucker for saving people or, or, or something <laughs> like that. Um, that was a great quote. So actually, that's a great segue into this next question. Um, and, I, and I think this is addressed in the film, but maybe for those of uh, our viewers who haven't yet seen the film, uh, you can explain how Francesca was able to procure so much food for, for 16 people without disco being discovered by the villagers. According to my grandfather's diary, uh, her, her son was very instrumental in this. Uh, he worked for an oil company. He would bring her barrels of oil and she would barter them at the local market for food. So that was one way she was able to get enough food. Also, you know, we were, we were there. We saw her, uh, her garden. She, you know, she grew a lot of potatoes. She had some pigs. She had an apple tree. And basically they ate what she grew in her garden. I think say, hey, do you have any memories of anything else? No, and she had pigs and chickens, which she slaughtered from time to time and used them. Right, and th there was also some mention of, um, you know, people began to get suspicious about, uh, you know, because she would just, just say, I'm just feeding the pigs all this food and this waste is just coming from the pigs, uh, but, but people, s s some kind of, a, um, I, guess, I guess, smarter people <laughs> who, were, who, were, who were on to her um, were, were able to somehow figure out that it's, it's probably more than just pigs, um, but, but yeah. Um, so we have time, we have five or so minutes left, so I, that's, that's time for one more question. Um, if, uh, let me, let me just see here. So, okay, here's a question actually that um, I'm, I'm curious myself uh, about the, the music in the film. Um, the music stood out to me as being particularly beautiful. Um, and, and this question comes from Lee. Uh, he, he feels the same way and he wants to know, uh, Judy, how you went about selecting the pieces for the film and, and also the the last song uh, in, in the movie, uh, when you're doing the, the clips, like fast forward to, to where all of the, the, all of the family members are today. Um, can, can you tell us more about that song and the rest of the music? Make sure. Uh, so except for that song, the epilogue, all the music was written by my brother-in-law, uh, Izar Schechter. He's a mm -hmm. musician. He is, um, Vice President of the Rimon School of Music, uh, not far from here in, in uh, Ramat HaSharon. Uh, and he did all the music except for um, the last song you mentioned, which uh, is a song that was written by an Israeli band called Alma. And it was dedicated to um, a young man who was, I believe, killed in a terror attack named mm -hmm. Benita. And I happened, my husband had been on a trip to Israel at that point. We were living in the States then, and he brought back the album. And I heard that song, and I said, okay, I want this for our epilogue, something about it. And um, 
I had my uh, co-directors listen to it and they liked it as well. And I wrote to them and I said, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of money. This is a very shoestring operation. Would you be willing um, to let us use this song in the film, obviously for credit? And uh, they were happy to. Wonderful. Um, so we're just about out of time. Uh, this has been such a enlightening uh, conversation and the movie itself, uh, I want to echo what one of our viewers said. It was outstanding. Uh, thank you so much, Judy, for making it available to the public. That is, that is very generous of you and we're, and we're so grateful for the opportunity both to watch the film and to, to speak with you today. Um, thank you once again to, to Faye and to Debbie for, for joining us from all over, <laughs> from New Jersey, from Vermont and uh, Tel Aviv. Um, this was a, a fabulous conversation and I, I hope we can, uh, you know, do a repeat of this sometime in the future in person. It would be really, really swell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.